Hi, and welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. Today, we have a returning guest, Rob Kirby. He's with Kirby Analytics. That's kirbyanalytics.com. And I am very happy to have him back on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Rob, welcome back to the Spotlight. Dave, it's a pleasure to be with you once again. Hey, thanks for being here. And I wanted to start off with um, what's happening to globalism, because we're seeing that uh, the U.S. shot down the, the Paris Climate Accord. The U.S. is telling other countries they have to fund NATO. We're seeing that we're reworking NAFTA. The TPP is dead, sent a representative to the Belt and Road. And now we're changing the banking regulations. Do you see uh, globalism being dismantled? What's happening with globalism right now? I believe that globalism has hit some very, very large uh, speed bumps, uh, but I do not believe that globalism is dead and buried, at least not yet. So when you say not just yet, what do you mean? Like, do they have something planned or do they have something else up their sleeve or or is... is... Uh, Go ahead. uh, The answer to that question is yes, I believe that they have things planned or up their sleeve. These people, these people have shown... Uh, a great deal, uh, when I say these people, the globalists have shown a great deal of resilience. They seem to double down at every opportunity. It's, it's like, it's like with this, with this Trump Russia uh, narrative that the mainstream media in America has been trying to propagate and promote over the past number of months, Dave. Uh, it's been shown to largely be a complete nothing sandwich or a nothing burger as it's been referred to but these 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 clowns at at CNN and CNBC the Washington Post the New York Times they seem they seem to every time they they they're, they're made to look like fools for uh, you know pushing this narrative they seem to double down and 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 try to sensationalize uh, new granules of of nothing uh, regarding uh, Trump and and Russia or people around Trump and Russia. So like they, they they just don't seem to have any interest in uh, admitting defeat. Uh, and it's it's and it's not just the 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 Democrats that are that are involved in this. It's really a bipartisan effort. It's the highest levels of the Republican Party, uh, with Eddie Munster, uh, Ryan, and and uh, and McCain uh, uh, doing everything in their power, uh, seemingly uh, to me anyway, to undo the uh, or or delegitimize the, the Trump presidency. So no, I don't see them going away. Um, uh, it seems to me that they they continue to put up roadblocks and try to run interference. Whether whether it's whether it's in Trump's ability to name select and name people to key government positions uh, to to fill out the roster in his administration, um, they've just been running interference perpetually. I mean, Trump, by and large, his administration is still being run in many key positions is being run by holdovers from the Obama administration simply because. The vetting process for for potential uh, uh, Trump administration people uh, has been has been gummed up by the bureaucracy that was left in place uh, by Obama, and uh, uh, he is being prevented from governing effectively. Uh, but but all that being said, I think Trump has a, has accomplished a great deal. So and and you know. Uh, Illustrated by his uh, uh, taking America out of the uh, uh, this climate this climate hoax, uh, the the Trans Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, you know one of these one of these uh, uh, sovereignty usurping uh, uh, trade agreements, uh, which which are complete boondoggles uh, for concentration of, of of power in foreign lands. So. Uh, yeah, I don't see them going away. Uh, they're they're going to continue to k- kick up the good fight. And 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 just recently, we've seen Obama join, basically join forces with uh, with with George Soros uh, to to foment more um, difficulties on the domestic front for uh, for Trump. I mean, this is the first time, at least to my knowledge, this is the first time in American history that an ex president has basically gone to work uh, directly opposing. Uh, and you know, an incumbent uh, or a new president—it's—it's it's unprecedented. So no, they're not giving up. If anything, they're doubling down again. 
Yeah, it looks like, I mean, there's parts of me saying that, you know, globalism, he's trying to chip away at it. And the other part is saying that they're fully, completely still in control. I mean, look what happened. I mean, especially with the precious metals market and especially with um, what is happening with the uh, central banks and the economy and things like that. I mean, the precious metals market, they've been controlling for a very long time. And I'm talking about it's either the U.S. government, the central bank, um, or maybe the banking system. You might have a better handle on who's actually controlling it. But we saw just a couple weeks ago, silver was, I mean, it was smacked down and, you know, people were saying it was a fat finger error. It, you know, it was a glitch. Um, but we've seen these before. It's not like, oh, this is something new, but they're still trying to suppress gold and silver. That hasn't changed. The question to you is why are they still doing this? Why do they want gold and silver suppressed? And what's your take on what happened during this silver smackdown? Uh, the reason the precious metals are suppressed, Dave, is because they represent uh, the go-to alternative to the uh, uh, fiat U.S. dollar, and as as the as the historical go-to alternative to a currency that's being debased and and defaced by the people who have the uh, power to print it, uh, th this this becomes or this puts a big target on the back of the precious metals, in that the, they can't be seen to be viable alternatives, at least at least in the in, in the in the eyes of the people who control the uh, the plight of the U.S. dollar. Um, so so it's under uh, precious metals have been under a constant and and uh, persistent attack. For for the, for the very longest time, and you know, I, I as to as to when this is going to end, uh, I, I mean, I do believe there is an end uh, to this to this suppression, um, and and I do believe that the suppression ends under a scenario where uh, promises are made to deliver physical metal, and the physical metal is not available to deliver, and there will be uh, uh, there will be a default. And it might not be called a default. It might be a deck. Uh, you know, they'll they'll try to they'll try to dress it up or 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 put a put a beard on it and call it force majeure for different reasons. But the the end the end game will be that that precious metal will not be delivered to somebody who has demanded it. And and when that occurs, the the paper markets. Where infinite supply is is offered for sale by agents of the powers that be, uh, um, the the you know the the mustard of of providing infinite supply of paper to a market where the where the underlying physical uh, commodity is is very uh, rare and uh, and and in very finite supply. Uh, the, the infinite supply of paper versus the very finite supply of the physical metal that underlies uh, the, uh, the paper contracts. Uh, you, you, I think most people can can imagine how how that doesn't work out a uh, long run. It's it's not a sustainable model um, because you know th this the whole idea that these paper players can throw at the market three times global annual production. Of gold in in you know in a three day period, um, it, it it that's just a dog that doesn't hunt, or at least it doesn't hunt very long, uh, because people see it for what it is, and ultimately I see the the precious metals markets moving to cash and carry. But I'll tell you some. There's been some interesting developments that that have been uh, brought our way. Uh, one one I'd like to uh, uh, just bring to everybody's attention. Or highlight it because it's it's not it's not really all uh, my my work. But uh, uh, Craig Hemke or Turd Ferguson, as he's known in the uh, um, in, in, in our community, uh, with the he's the uh, proprietor of the Turd uh, Ferguson Metals Report, and he uh, he put out a paper uh, earlier this week where he was making an observation that uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, seemingly has stopped uh, accumulating gold and silver as of March of this year. Uh, and when I say stopped accumulating, uh, the, the amount the amount of uh, gold and silver flowing into their depository um, has 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 ceased. And and 
the amount of metal in their depository grew very rapidly between somewhere around 2015 up until January or February of this year, and then it's just stopped. And it, and it had been been growing at a very aggressive rate. Uh, literally every every contract, uh, every every contract as it matured, they they would be accumulating a lot. And I, I, something that I found really really interesting was that J.P. Morgan got into the depository business with precious metals back in April of 2011. And for people who who've been uh, following the silver market for any amount of time, knows that it was uh, May of 2011 uh, when we had our uh, famous drive-by shooting in the silver market where the silver market market plummeted from $49 down to $42 within seconds of trade opening on a Sunday night. Um, and that marked, and that marked the collapse of the silver market to the, basically down to the levels that we see today, $16, $17 range for silver. And I find it very interesting that literally right at the time when JP Morgan got involved in, in handling physical metal silver price collapsed uh, because you know it has it has an eerie similarity uh, if you want to go back to the 2006 time frame JP Morgan started trading natural gas and it was it was at the very literally at the very moment that JP Morgan start, opened up a natural gas trading desk that the price of natural gas plummeted from sixteen dollars down to what are, where are we today? Two or three dollars for for natural gas, and you know it's it's no coincidence to me because I don't believe that I don't believe in coincidences to begin with. But I find it very interesting that the minute J.P. Morgan entered the natural gas trade, the price of natural gas collapsed, and then we had the collapse or the bankruptcy of. Uh, uh, of Amaranth, which was a big natural gas trading uh, uh, facility, a hedge fund, uh, uh, back in that time frame. And um, J.P. Morgan had been serving as Amaranth's uh, banker and Amaranth's uh, um, uh, broker uh, to, to purchase natural and, and to trade natural gas contracts. And, not, and and Amaranth was basically a long a long fund on natural gas. And uh, uh, lo and behold, J.P. Morgan entered that business and basically took the other side of Amaranth's trades and crushed them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, and I've written about it. Uh, I mean, uh, articles in uh, are in the public domain that I've written regarding uh, uh, J.P. Morgan and and Amaranth's demise and 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 how and how. To how correlated uh, J.P. Morgan's entry into that market is tied to the collapse of the of the natural gas price. Well, and isn't it interesting that he, once again we can tie J.P. Morgan's uh, entry into the into the warehousing of physical metal to the collapse of the price of silver? Um, anyway, I, I I have to do some more work on that, and there'll be a paper coming on that. But the 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 coincidence of these two very strategic markets collapsing uh, um, when when J.P. Morgan uh, makes entry into these markets uh, really, really stands out like a sore thumb to me. Yeah, I don't believe in a coincidence. This is exactly what they've done. They saw an opportunity, they were prepared, and they brought it down, and it wasn't a coincidence. And we could see it all over the, the entire economy. I mean, with manipulation going on everywhere, it's not just in one little area, but there is one area where we can see what kind of an open market looks like in the crypto market, where we're seeing the ups and downs and things actually make a little bit more sense than they do in the precious metals market, in the stock market, in the economy with the manipulated numbers there. And every time I look at the crypto market, I think, wow, if gold and silver were able to trade freely like the crypto market, we would see the ups and downs and the prices moving up like this, just like the crypto market. I, I wanted to get your take on what you think is happening in the crypto market. Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I, I agree fully with what you just stated. And uh, to, be, to, be, to be quite honest and frank about it, I believe that the gyrations that we are seeing in, for instance, in Bitcoin, 
where the price can be up or down $300 in a day is, is exactly what gold would be doing <clears throat> if, if the gold market was not shackled and strapped to a gurney uh, uh, complements of the, the likes of J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs and Citibank. Who, who, by the way, are the agents uh, and the, uh, uh, let's just say they're, they're the, they are the go-to people in the, uh, or interface with public markets that the exchange stabilization fund, the secretive arm of the U.S. Treasury, uh, passes their orders to through the conduit of the, uh, New York Federal Reserve trading desk. And, you know, the, the, uh, and, and I want to get to this point of who's really behind the manipulation. And I've discussed with a lot of compatriots in the, in the alternative uh, universe um, that it's my contention and belief that the Exchange Stabilization Fund, uh, whose mission uh, was created in 1934, and its mission was basically to defend and protect and preserve and promote the uh, use of the U.S. dollar, uh, and, and, and to protect its primacy as the world's reserve currency. And um, I believe that the ESF is behind the manipulations we see in the capital markets or the bulk of the manipulations we see in the capital markets. And if, you, if you've ever taken time to, to watch Eric D. Carbonell's uh, expose on the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which you can you can view by going to uh, the website marketskeptics.com. And if you look in the right-hand margin of the homepage, you will see a, a, uh, a link uh, that'll be headed by the words, something I've been afraid to blog about, uh, the ESF. And if you and if you click on that link, you'll you'll come to a five part YouTube uh, expose on the exchange stabilization fund. And what what this uh, expose explains is the relationship between the ESF and the Fed and how the how the ESF is the real muscle uh, uh, behind interventions in international markets. But the ESF doesn't like to take the credit. They, they, they're happy to have the Fed take the credit or, or, or be assigned the credit for the, for the aberrations that they create in, in, the, uh, <laughs> in the capital markets. Um, and, and, and the reason I think it's important for people to understand that uh, – so anyway, uh, let, me, let me just first say this uh, – the, the, the expose on the ESF explains the, the relationship of the Federal Reserve being the prime broker for the ESF. All ESF orders are passed through the New York Federal Reserve trading desk, and then, and then the New York Fed disseminates those orders off to the commercial banks. So these would be the behemoth uh, American uh, derivatives houses, uh, uh, which is principally five big players. And the five big players in, in U.S. derivatives, uh, and these, and, and when I say the, the biggest players, these five players hold like 99% of all derivatives held by American financial institutions. So, and the, and these five institutions are J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley, the magnificent five. So, uh, the reason I think it's important to understand that it's the ESF that that has that that really controls things is because if you're going to effectively uh, um, go to war with with an enemy, you have to know who your enemy is. And I think a lot of people are misplaced by perpetually blaming the Federal Reserve for all that goes wrong. And I'm not saying the Federal Reserve are good guys or the Federal Reserve is 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 a great institution, but I'll tell you one thing. I think I think it's it's very clear to me the reason why uh, uh, the Fed does not ever want to be uh, uh, audited, and there's been so much resistance on both the government side and the banking side to to a to a real audit of the Federal Reserve. Be, because an audit, I do believe, if it was transparent, it would it would very clearly show that the, the Fed is acting for the Exchange Stabilization Fund, and it's really people who have captured the 
bureaucracy or, or that America's government is, is, is in fact been basically taken over. And uh, I think it's important to get that straight because if things are ever going to change, I think I think what needs to happen is is the the real culprit uh, uh, behind these uh, interventions and this market rigging. The, the true culprits have to be identified, and ultimately, the power, at least to me, rests with the Exchange Stabilization Fund that has that has dark money at its disposal that I believe amounts to many many trillions of dollars. Of, of undeclared and unseen money. So, Rob, who actually is running the Exchange Stabilization Fund? Like, is it is it the Treasury Department? Is it one individual? Is it a group of people? The, the you know, the, 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 let's just say the name on the desk or the name on the office door where, where, the, where the ESF is run from is the, is the Treasury Secretary. And... I, I would, I would, I would believe. Let's just say it's part of the executive branch of government, and let's just say, uh, and I and I've stated this recently. I I actually am at a point now where I wonder. I really wonder if if Donald Trump really got to select his choice for Treasury Secretary. I wonder if that was something that he was maybe maybe very frightened by. In the uh, uh, in between between election day and 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 his uh, inauguration, uh, Trump visited the White House, and and Trump uh, uh, referenced and and I mean when he was sitting in the Oval Office with Obama uh, after the election where, when he had won, um, he, there was a there was a an impromptu press conference that was given where Trump looked like he had an extremely frightened look on his face. And he made reference to, uh, 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 when he's, when he said a few words, he, he made reference to, he found out some things that he, you know, didn't know, or, or there were some surprises. And, uh, I'm wondering if, if one, if, if, if the surprise or one of the surprises might've been, uh, him being filled in on the extent to which the exchange stabilization fund is is uh, a presence in our capital markets, and I, I literally wonder if he might have been told um, your your picks for, for treasury secretary are A or B, and this way when Trump picks what he picked, which which ended up being Steve Mnuchin, uh, I, you know. He can he can say, well, I picked him. Well, of course, you picked him, but you were given you, you you had a choice of A or B, and you chose A. But is that really a choice? It's it's sort of like it's sort of like if if you think back to the time of of, of the or or think think about the uh, uh, think about the Chinese political system and uh, do people really have a choice? Like, is is there anyone on the ballot? in elections in China other than uh, uh, people who are members of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. And, and, I, and I question whether, whether Trump might not have really had a choice. And he was told it's going to be, it's going to be A or B because the powers that be that are, that really do control the U S government, uh, you know, they own it, you know, they, they, they own it. And, and, and like America is an occupied country and there's a lot of people who talk in those terms in the alternative press. And I just wonder how deep the control goes. And I and I actually wonder whether Trump really did have a choice. Like like I wonder if I wonder if Donald Trump had said he really, really wants to have Catherine Austin Fitz as his next Treasury Secretary, whether that would have been allowed. Most likely not. <laughs> so I, and I frame it up in those terms. And and you know and that that being said uh, I don't think Catherine Fitz would be interested in the job, but I mean, to me, she would make a wonderful Treasury Secretary, completely wonderful Treasury Secretary. But I, I just, I don't, for some reason, I just don't think that that would be allowed. I, I don't think she's on the approved list, and I think you have to be on the approved list to be considered for choice. And I don't think the approved list is designed by the president. I think the president is dictated to and told these are your choices. And this way, when he picks one, he can say he chose. But it's I, really, 
it's you know it's it's really all it is it's a it's a legalese sort of thing where where you can you know you have culpable deniability uh you know uh, and you can and you can say hogwash i chose i chose the person well yeah you chose the person from a pool of two <laughs> it's right. not really a choice <laughs> You said the ESF, they're the ones propping up the dollar right now? I believe so, yes. Do you see countries dumping the dollar? Yeah. Turn- uh, I mean, countries have been, over the past two years, on, an, on a net basis, countries have been lightening up on their U.S. government securities. And, and, and the countries that have been lightening up over the past couple of years include China, they include Japan, they include Saudi Arabia, and these are countries that are traditionally America's uh, uh, largest financiers. So my question has been over the last couple of years, like I, I can't really I can't really point to any entity and, and say this is who's buying the bonds that are being liquidated by America's uh, typical uh, uh, lenders. So like the bonds are disappearing. The, like the bonds are being sold. And, and my belief is they're being memory hold. They're, they're being they're they're being bought by bark, uh, dark money out of the exchange stabilization fund, and this is why the bonds aren't showing up in the ledgers of any other countries. So you know you 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 inject dark money into into the markets, and uh, uh, the bonds come out of the market and they go into the dark hole. And 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 what what logically would you have as a uh, I mean this this would be philosophically this would be a very inflationary uh, uh, type type of uh, activity or, or action and lo and behold what do we have we have real estate markets around the world that are just going up at at, at tremendous rates I mean real estate's bubbling I mean I li- I live in Toronto in Canada and. And and the real estate market in Toronto, it's 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 just been on fire, as it has been in Vancouver, as it has been in London, England, as it has been in in many cities around America. But I mean, this is this is not something this is not something you would expect uh, to, to to happen uh, when 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 there's less money around. To me, what it sounds like you're saying is that they have the ability to control almost every aspect of the economy by, you know, pushing money into real estate, by keeping precious metals down, by dictating to the Fed what they want them to do. Yeah, but but like look at it from this standpoint, Dave. The, the Federal Reserve tells us they, they, you know, tells us they haven't been engaged in QE for years, a few years now. It's not the Federal Reserve that's doing the QE. It's the ESF. So, so the Federal Reserve can actually make the statement. They're not engaged in QE, but the ESF is because the ESF, the ESF will always make sure there's a bid for U.S. U.S. government bonds. You know, here's another another very interesting factoid, which which I'd love somebody to explain to me. You see, uh, Germany, for instance, who is basically uh, viewed as the best credit. In, in the European uh, system, and uh, um, Germany uh, has 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 in the past had failed bond auctions where they could not auction bonds. Failed auction. There wasn't enough bids to to cover the amount of bonds they wanted to sell. And, and and it's happened like on like on many occasions in Germany. But America's never had a failed bond auction, not publicly anyway. And I'll tell you, there's a reason why America has never had a failed bond auction. Because they have the ESF in, in, in the background who will always make sure that bids, a sufficient number of bids are made, that they have a successful bond auction. You can take that to the bank because I'll just tell you something. Uh, there, have been, there, have been times, there have been times in the last 20 years when conditions have been such that there should have been a failed bond auction, but there never is. And the garbage that we're fed, the garbage that we're fed as as to uh, uh, you know how how deep how deep and and how robust the the U.S. Uh, government securities market is 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 a, is is a fairy tale, just just like the fairy tale of of 9/11 and a building falling a 50-story building building seven in the World Trade Complex falling without a plane hitting it. It's a complete fairy tale, and it's a complete fairy tale. To, to suggest that the U.S. would never have had a, a failed auction. 
Well, and the only reason they haven't, uh, it's, you know, it's because there's this entity uh, uh, that's there in the background with unthinkable, literally unthinkable amounts of money. And, and, and they're there and they're there to provide a bid. So there's always a bid. That's why there is always a bid for U.S. government securities. Do you know where this dark money comes from? Like, how is it flowing into the ESF? Well, you know, the ESF, the ESF was created in 1934, Dave. And the way it was created is the U.S. Treasury uh, confiscated gold from the American public. And the gold uh, uh, was revalued. Uh, the, the Treasury, when they confiscated the gold, they paid everyone $20 and 60 cents or $20 and change per ounce uh, in fiat money. And then six months later, they revalued that gold up to $35 an ounce. And that created a windfall profit of between two and three billion dollars in 1934. And that money was used to seed the exchange stabilization fund, that windfall profit. That was the seed capital for the ESF. And, you know, Three billion dollars in 1934 uh, made the ESF the most powerful financial entity on the planet, bar none, hands and fists above anything else in the world. So, you know, the ESF does not exactly come from humble beginnings. The ESF in, in its in its inception had a scary, scary amount of money. And if you do watch the expose on the ESF, uh, uh, at, at, at Mark, uh, that I uh, spoke about the link to which is at marketskeptics.com, you, you, you will see that basically the central banks themselves, uh, the central bankers themselves were very, very concerned that so much money was going to be put into uh, 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 such, uh, let's just say, an, an opaque uh, uh, entity uh, where where it was going to be controlled by, you know, basically shadowy uh, uh, forces. So, yeah. So you, uh, you know, this I, I'm trying to deal with with your your question. You see, the ESF is engaged uh, basically uh, d d is not subject to any laws. The ESF is not subject to any oversight. The ESF does not produce contrary to what anybody else might tell you. The ESF does not produce comprehensive annual financials. They, they are free to trade in absolutely anything they, they deem uh, uh, relevant to their mandate. So it, like if, if it's relevant to their mandate to uh, have regime change in a country, they, 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 they're engaged in that. If, if it's relevant that they're involved in shadowy arms dealing, they do that. If, it, if it's relevant to be involved in, in look, you name it, drugs, uh, 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 you, know, you can go to some pretty dark places. So, you know, the, the notion that these guys, the notion that these guys have have unthinkable wealth is is not really a stretch when you consider the range of what they are capable of dealing in, which is anything. They don't pay tax and they don't produce financials. So you tell me what what a three billion dollar animal uh, created in 1934. Uh, uh, basically subject to no rules, no tax, uh, no, no audit. Um, you know, and, and, and the other thing I, I will also mention, uh, w whereas the ESF has no oversight, the, the Federal Reserve uh, does have to come before Congress twice a year and, you know, the Senate Banking Committee and, and answer, uh, answer to uh, lawmakers under oath twice a year. No such no such rule applies to the ESF, and you know, and and it's also it's also very interesting uh, to note that nobody nobody in in Washington, nobody in the mainstream financial, uh, nobody on Wall Street, nobody will talk about the exchange stabilization fund, and you know, any any politician or any banker that would start talking honest honestly about the exchange stabilization fund would be as welcome as Edward Snowden. Because it's a matter of national security. And of course, the uh, uh, preservation of the dollar as the world's reserve currency is, is a matter of national security. Because that's what America is. But it's really a lot of smoke and mirrors. That's what it really is. As countries continually 
you know, move away from the dollar, what are these individuals going to do? Because their whole system is based on having the dollar as the reserve currency and, and having control over the world. No, listen, other countries, Dave, are coming mm -hmm. up the curve and, and, and get it. Other countries realize that there's a reason why America can do things that nobody else can. And it's not, and it's not intuitively because Americans are smarter or because Americans work harder. It's because Americans have these, have these, these, <laughs> they, they've, they've got these, uh, trick, trick things that are put in place that, that people are getting jiggy with. That's why, that's why countries around the world are, are, are negotiating, uh, you know, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements amongst themselves where they exclude the dollar from, uh, settlement and trade. And, and, and these deals are being negotiated all over the place and have been uh, being done so now for the last number of years. This is, this is why countries uh, are, 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 are wagering into the or, or wading into the cryptocurrency uh, realm because the, 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 the cryptocurrency realm doesn't allow for an exchange stabilization fund type of entity uh, uh, to, you know, to, to manipulate it. You can't have you can't have dark cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is 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 legitimate. Uh, it's it's basically it's tamper proof, okay. And that's why there's been a lot of that's why a lot of a lot of countries have been, uh, uh, you know, loath to uh, endorse it. And uh, you know, I'll, I will say this: cryptocurrencies and the adoption of cryptocurrencies stand as a very 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 big problem. For U.S. dollar uh, uh, preservation or preservation of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency on a go-forward basis, it absolutely stands as an impediment. So, um, you know, where the cryptos go from here, I think they're going to continue to be adopted. Um, you know, there, there are aspects to the cryptocurrencies that scare the living daylights out of me. In in that. Uh, you know, cryptocurrencies are dependent on a, a, a free and functional and operating internet, which which means that the power grid isn't interrupted, uh, and that sort of doesn't sit well with me, because I don't think it's a I don't think it's a given that we will always have dependable power. I don't think it's a given that we will always have a free internet. Um, so. You know, where do we go from here? But but let's 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 just be certain on one thing. The reason the cryptocurrencies are exploding in value is because they represent another anti-dollar trade. Just as a run into physical precious metal is an anti-dollar trade, uh, uh, the rush for cryptocurrencies is also another anti-dollar trade. And the reason these things are going up is because the the traditional go-to uh, um, uh, dollar alternatives have been have been neutered and have been strapped to the gurney. And I'll tell you something: they won't remain strapped to the gurney forever. And th and, and their time is coming. But it's 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 going to be physical precious metal that's going to appreciate, not the not the discredited paper uh, derivatives of metal. So anyway, that's where we're headed. And how fast we get there is anyone's guess. Um, you know, timing timing could be short. Uh, timing could even be immediate, because we we could be in a window right now where where a complete and utter uh, reboot of our financial system might have to be undertaken at any time going forward. So. We're living in unprecedented times, Dave. Yes, we are. Rob, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? You can catch me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. Fantastic. Thank you very much for being on the Spotlight. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Dave.